I'm Xu Yin, and I'm an investment principal at Unitas Impact. Um, we're a venture capital firm with the dual mission of improving the livelihoods of the working poor and generating a strong financial return for our investors. So today I want to pose the question, what if venture capital look different? And I don't just mean more diverse, although that's also an important issue to me, and I'll touch on that later. But also, you know, what if venture capital was not just about outsized returns, but can you also build companies which serve the poor, disrupt systems, rewrite the rules? So I'm not sure how many of you watch the TV show Silicon Valley. It's one of my favorites, um, even if it's a little too close to home sometimes. And in many episodes, they, you know, satirize this claim amongst many Silicon Valley startups that they're making the world a better place. But what if you could actually invest in companies which were doing that? So at the heart of our investment thesis at Unitas Impact is this idea that in many emerging markets, systems have evolved um, in ways which, you know, in, in, in which the structures, you know, disempower the poor. Um, so, for example, uh, due to market inefficiencies in many situations, smallholder farmers only capture a small proportion of the final retail price. Um, so our question is, you know, how do we ungame the system, so to speak, such that these farmers uh, are able to get their fair share of the economic value? So, for example, uh, we've invested in a company called Vasha in Indonesia. Um, it's an agricultural supply chain company. And in general, um, you know, market-based interventions in agriculture work in kind of specialty or premium crops, right? Um, it's the only way that, or many people perceive that it's the only way in which, you know, appropriate margin can be passed all the way down um, to, to the farmer. But in Varsham's case, um, the founder had this vision to reach 100,000 uh, farmers by 2020. And he realized that that would be impossible if he was doing it in a specialty or niche crop. He decided that also, you know, what, what, if, what if I could do this in maize? What if I could do this in a staple, staple um, value chain? Um, so what Varsham does is it works across the entire value chain. Um, it provides profit share, um, sharing financing, which is also Sharia compliant. Uh, it provides access to high quality inputs. It provides um, training on agricultural best practices um, and offtake at an above market price. And in this way, it's able to deliver a 65% income increase on average to um, farmers over the past three growing cycles. It's currently working with about 6,500 farmers in um, various parts of Indonesia and is looking to scale that to 100,000 farmers. Um, it's got a very nice modular solution um, and they're also planning to take that into other staple crops such as soybean and rice. One of our other investments is into a company called M Clinica, which started off in the Philippines. And what they're doing is they're building a digital network of pharmacies in Southeast Asia. Um, and in doing so, they're able to provide real-time last mile data on what people are buying over the counter um, at these pharmacies for the first time. And this is incredibly valuable information both to um, the big pharma companies, but also public health organizations, NGOs. And in that way, the impact can be really transformative, you know, in terms of tackling things like counterfeit medicines, um, disease outbreaks, expired medicines, um, things like this. A few other investments, I'm in an online education company in Vietnam, I'm an employee benefits company in, uh, also in Vietnam, which provides 0% financing to factory workers, a bunch of things, uh, mom and pop stores in, in Indonesia. And you know, for us, it's really exciting to be working with these entrepreneurs with this vision to reach the working poor in innovative ways. Shifting gears a bit, uh, so as you, know, you might know of my personal stories, as I'm not actually <laughs> from, or I haven't taken that kind of route, which is typical for a venture capitalist. Um, I didn't found a tech company, I didn't, well, actually, even worse, I'm an ex-management consultant, and <laughs> many people don't know what we're good for, and sometimes I, I kind of agree. I, I look a bit different from, from the typical venture capitalist, and I find it quite amusing when I receive all these communications which say, you know, hey, bro, or dear gents, and dear Mr. Tang, and, um, <laughs> and oh, I'm sure some, some of the ladies in the room have also been there, and, you know, it's just like, well, if you're asking me for money, um, please take that kind of 30 seconds to, to do your research. Um, so, you know, it's 2017, and I think the venture capital industry still looks a bit like this. I mean, you know, depending on which kind of source you consult, anywhere between 5 to 10% of decision makers in the venture capital industry are women. And, you know, that's not actually moving in the right direction. 
Um, so, you know, we're serious about changing that. Um, we're setting up one of the first funds, perhaps the first fund, for investing in high-growth women-led businesses in Southeast Asia. That will be launching this year, and we're super excited about that. In my personal capacity, I founded a startup called um, Invest with Impact, which is a talent agency for the impact investing sector. Um, so, you know, really, uh, industry is the people who work within it, and we wanted to play a role in, in shaping that um, and, and ensuring that kind of diverse voices are heard. So we work with um, impact investors, universities, talent themselves, corporates to kind of tell them more about impact investing and show that there are many different pathways into the space. So, you know, that's just a little bit about kind of my work and, and my story. Um, and, you know, I generally do believe that the venture capital industry, you know, when it celebrates kind of diversity of background and experience, ethnicity and age, it will be a better thing. And so I want to end you with that same question that I started with, which is, you know, what a venture capital were different. I'm James Song, uh, managing principal at Faircap Partners. We work in Myanmar, born and raised in New York, uh, also run a startup called Mithra and Deer Labs. My story is very different. My pathway is very different, very non-traditional. Uh, I graduated in 05, Harvard University. thought I would end up doing a PhD there and becoming a professor. I thought that was my career path. So I won a Fulbright to do uh, HIV research in Uganda. And uh, the first year there, since my background was in psychology and it was a psychological intervention to uh, boost CD4 cell counts in uh, HIV positive patients. Uh, the first year there, I saw a lot of people, a lot of my patients that I was seeing dying uh, because their HIV was progressing to AIDS uh, very quickly. And uh, there's a concept in uh, medicine called comorbidity, meaning you get a disease while you have a disease. And that disease in Uganda largely is malaria, which weakens the immune system enough where HIV progresses to AIDS. And there's really nothing I could have done about it, you know, as, as an HIV researcher. Um, so, you know, I started looking into the issue. I had a chance after my Fulbright year was up to go back to the States and do more research and then apply to PhD programs. And uh, the problem was, uh, you know, like these mosquitoes were being bred in still pools of water. These still pools of water were caused by blocked sewage pipes. These sewage pipes were blocked by uh, litter, rubbish, uh, and mostly plastic bags that people have bought something with and then thrown away because they needed the product but not the plastic bag. So I decided to learn everything I could about plastic recycling and open up a plastic recycling factory. And uh, it was the first modern polyethylene plastic recycling plant in all of East Africa. And then we over the next uh, three years, built up a East African-wide kind of collection network, a very gray market, uh, uh, worked uh, in spite of authorities who always would try to ticket us or stop our activities because we weren't officially sanctioned by the city and we didn't have uh, this maze of, we, we didn't go through this maze of uh, permits and approvals that you needed to do anything in Africa. So that was very difficult for us. And in 2010, uh, after I received a master's in uh, neuroscience, uh, I realized I couldn't grow the business anymore, meaning we started to recycle so much plastic, we needed to start importing it into Uganda. And the Ugandan government was very against bringing in what they perceived as garbage into their country. So I knew I had to take an exit. And then at that point, with the neuroscience background, I sold everything and I started a oncology research-based biotech hedge fund in New York. But during that first year, I also got a call about Myanmar uh, to look at the, uh, it was a KFC master franchise license deal for the country, which I thought was a very good deal. And uh, it's just the terms weren't right. They were very not American terms, very Asian terms, and uh, I couldn't fill it. But uh, you know, uh, I knew a lot of people in the region, so they said, you know, why don't you come and look at other deals? And so I did. And the thing is, uh, the reason why I started from where, when I graduated is because during my time in Africa, I was there for five years, I would travel through uh, into Asia to China and Taiwan to buy machinery. And uh, I would often stop in Singapore. And I would meet a lot of people in Singapore over the years. And I realized in 2012 that a lot of the people I met in Singapore were not Singaporean, but they were Burmese working in Singapore because they couldn't work out of Burma. After meeting with them, looking at deals, uh, one of the things that I got involved in early on as an undergraduate was uh, supporting this orphanage in Myanmar. It was a friend in Singapore 
you know, it was something she was very involved in. So she said, James, just send $10 a month. You could help these kids. I said, it's no problem. You know, and then over the years, I had paid enough money where I sent six of those kids to university. And I wanted to know what happened to those kids. You know, so uh, during my first visit, I paid a visit to the orphanage and I, and, uh, I, I realized none of the kids were there. You know, I know two were trained as uh, engineers. One went to school for medicine, but they, they weren't there. They all ended up going to Dubai. Because at the time, in 2012, if you were university educated and you could speak good English, uh, you were paid about $75 a month. That was the going salary. But in Dubai, to sweep floors at a shopping mall, you got paid about $600 a month. So that was a very good opportunity for them. So, you know, I understood the economics and why they left. But I also felt, I also felt it was unfair. Uh, you know, I looked at these kids and I realized, you know, I'm coming from New York, never been to this country before and I get to see the best deals that they had to offer. You know, but these kids, they grow up, they work, they get educated in the country, they would never see these deals. And I thought there was something very wrong with that. And during my time growing up, you know, I, saw, I saw the Berlin Wall come down and I saw the opportunities in East Berlin when everyone left. I saw the opportunities in Russia during the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. And I thought Myanmar was very similar. There were opportunities to take there and uh, they weren't being, uh, they weren't being properly explored, and uh, there was a lot of crony capitalism. There still is, and I thought a lot of value was being left on the table by not investing in these people. So today, when people ask me what I do, I start off by telling them the truth, the very basic truth, which is I support this orphanage and the kids in it, and I think uh, that is where, in my philosophy, that is where real investment comes from, investing in people and the things that they could produce. So uh, we ended up forming a private equity fund in 2012, uh, the first American private equity fund in Myanmar. Some of the first successes we had, we brought in Stata, which is a German pharmaceutical manufacturer, built the first uh, pharmaceutical plant that wasn't owned by the government. Uh, we built a dairy factory to make baby formula for, for women who couldn't uh, produce uh, nutritious milk for, the, for their babies. And then, over the last couple of years, I've seen the quality of the deals deteriorate. Not that you can't make money there, but as a country grows, you know, it gets overheated and a lot of people start making the same thing. So there were a lot of five-star hotels being built. And, you know, like, I understand being the first, but being the seventh five-star hotel, I couldn't wrap my, you know, I couldn't get into investing in something like that. Or, you know, being the, being the eighth or the twelfth cafe in town serving, you know, Italian coffee. It just didn't make sense to me. So last year we formed an angel investment group. You know, we thought we would invest in more uh, high potential founders in Myanmar and look at uh, more uh, deals that were more inclusive of the people there and deals that were more innovative. And uh, we just couldn't find a lot of sophisticated partners uh, to invest in because the issue is we could, it's no problem giving seed money and it's no problem for them to build technology. But at some point, they're gonna to have to raise a series A or B in Singapore or Japan. That's where all the money is centered in the region. And we couldn't put our teams against Singaporean teams. We couldn't set them up to fail in that way because just this, they weren't good enough, you know, as founders uh, in, a, in a global system. They just weren't up to par. Uh, just to give you an idea, in 2013, there were zero Facebook users in Myanmar just because there was no internet access. Today, you know, there are over 50 million Facebook users in Myanmar, and that is just in a span of a couple of years. But that also means Myanmar passed over that whole part of the internet where everyone got an email address. So instead of email, people pay a shopkeeper who will sign up for a Gmail account because they don't know about Gmail, who will open a Facebook account for them. And then that's how it works in Myanmar. So um, we thought the way to really solve this is not to try to fit Myanmar into a traditional system or a traditional structure, but really build organically from within the country. So right now we run a startup uh, called Mithrandir Labs, which uses uh, predictive analytics to improve education. To get someone where they could get do serious damage, like an ordinary person, learning, coding, you know, different programming languages, usually takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months. If you screen for just a couple of personal factors and then you teach them coding, uh, you get that down to three and a half months. 
So it accelerates the program. And it seems very far-fetched at first, but you have to think about it this way. You have a child. And let's say that child's eight or 10 years old. You realize this person, this kid, is talented at soccer, more talented than anyone else in his class. So you say, maybe I should hire a coach. The coach says, this kid has a lot of talent. Maybe you should hire a professional coach because by the time this kid is 18 or 19, he has a chance to be in the World Cup if you do it right. But if you think about it, nobody does that for talent you know, across the board. So uh, in America specifically, uh, we test a lot for um, math and quantitative skills and verbal reasoning but we leave something called spatial reasoning off the table. And if you could imagine for a moment, if I took a bottle of water, drank, drank a bit out of it, and then kept the bottle tilted and asked how much was left, there was, would be an immediate calculation of how much I drank and how much was left in the bottle. And that kind of intelligence we ignore completely. But we found through our research that those actually make the best uh, software engineers. But you know, nobody's screening for that. No one's putting the programming courses in front of those people. Nobody's challenging them the way they need to be challenged. So for instance, uh, again, back with the, the athletic talent, if you challenge that child uh, in a way that they can adapt to it, that they have the capacity to adapt it, they can realize the potential of their talent. And we leave a lot of that on the table across the board in education. So that is generally what I do in Myanmar. I invest in people, you know, I try to make them better and I try to put money behind them. Do you ever encounter like, what, why are we investing in Myanmar? Where the heck is Myanmar? Why would, because most people, um, I've done this uh, academic study, the most of the VCs in, South, in the ASEAN region, less, if you counted how many invested th at least 30% of their portfolio in their own country, you'd get maybe five. People don't want to invest in Myanmar, period. Uh, you need to find people uh, who will meet certain barriers and you need to walk them through the barriers. So I'm gonna to speak to you very tactically right now. You need to find people of the investment, of uh, people within the investment universe, people who will commit to visiting Myanmar. That's first. No one will invest in Myanmar unless they first visit or at least will commit to visiting. And that we've seen to be true. So they visit, you do an investor tour, and then uh, they'll want to talk about terms and look at some investment projects that you have, so you show them those, and then uh, everything from there is kind of easy. Now the thing is, this is the way the investment space works. You're welcome to disagree, but this is my view from an outsider raising money inside the investment world and not, I am a neuroscientist, that's what I know. You need to cast a very wide net because in a place like Myanmar, only 5% of all high net worth investors or um, family offices would ever think about investing in Myanmar. They have to go first before institutions will invest in Myanmar. So you need to capture that 5%. So family offices, they have very specific conferences that they go to to talk about family office best practices. And uh, for high net worth investors today, what I would do today if I was raising a fund again is uh, Facebook dark posts, making commercials on Facebook and targeting specific high, ultra high net worth individuals going to specific conferences. So for instance, the Monaco Yacht Show, you know, a very specific type of person goes there. Now I do not recommend ever exhibiting there, but you could Facebook dark post that one particular area of Monaco and s send your message out there and it will cost you maybe three cents a view. That's how cheap it'll be. So you could spend $500 and just carpet that entire event. And it's a very cheap, low cost, high return way of marketing that thing. So that's tactically. Uh, but the other thing is, is building commitment to an idea. And that starts, like I said, getting them to visit. Do you feel there's a growing sort of interest from the local conglomerates, families, even government, when you explain to them the cause and the potential impact that it can have on the, the national population? You know, I, I think there is a positive shift. I mean, so even, I, I think while a lot of our investors, our LPs are from, um, I guess, yeah, Europe, US, et cetera, um, we do actually have a large number of Indonesian families who invested into our fund. They have 
run kind of large family businesses conglomerates. Um, and we gradually see that um, that there are you know more kind of allocations towards philanthropic type purposes. I think the challenge is that a lot of it still goes into traditional charity. Um, and I think I think there's this myth that kind of like oh Asians don't give in the same way. I think they absolutely are giving, but like often it's still kind of more traditional philanthropy. Um, this idea. You know, they've got one part of their portfolio which is really about maximizing financial return. They've got another part of their portfolio which is about maximizing impact. And I think that that is there. Um, but like when you're trying to kind of do both, I mean, they're like, how can that be? How can that be possible? So I think it's more about changing that, again, like telling the story of and, and showing them like here are the specific com- types of companies which do this, right? Because I think it becomes so like much more real when you're actually seeing these examples. My, my experience has been very different. Uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of... Uh, there's a plundering mentality that no one talks about, but it's, it's there. Uh, they, they want to uh, do some version of rent-seeking, land-grabbing, you know, where, where they want to get as many resources as they can for as cheap a price as they can, uh, where there's some kind of sophistication or knowledge arbitrage between uh, the investor and the asset owner. And then they want to sit on it and try to make as much money because they are a little bit sophisticated, whether it be from technology or other... So there are deals that happen in Myanmar, for instance, just to give you an example, where uh, like some investor will come in and say, give me this plot of land, I want to buy it for this price, a very cheap price. And then you know, like the Myanmar government will say, you know, like, why do you want this piece of land? It's just junk, it's a bunch of rocks, you can't really do anything with it. And then you realize you know, they have geological expertise, there's gold, you know, and that's why they're mining there now, you know, a lot of uh, environmental destruction. So there is that kind of arbitrage going on. It's been my experience, and I can only speak about my experience personally, uh, is that... Uh, we haven't found any investor impact or not that wasn't first interested in investment returns. And that's why that conversation about Myanmar, which is the fastest growing economy in the region, that's how that conversation started. I mean, I, I agree. Like, it's not to, to say that we were there and that um, this is going to be this huge shift in capital markets taking place. Um, no, I don't think that day is coming anytime too soon. But I think small steps, right? And I think um, that's what keeps me optimistic. <laughs>